Welcome to episode 17 of the Pop Anime Comics Lounge. My guest today is Jenny Kwan, the voice of Suki from Avatar The Last Airbender. But before we get into the interview, I'd like to remind everybody to check out popanimecomics.com for articles about anime, comics, and pop culture. And when you click on the affiliate links located in the article, I get a small commission when you purchase something from Amazon.com, which helps keep this podcast up and running. So without further ado, let's dive right into this interview. How were you first exposed to acting? Wow, I was exposed really young. When I was a kid, I was super shy. And so my mom got me singing lessons. That really kind of helped me get out of my shell. And then I was in a singing group called Kids of the Century, which was this performing troupe that would perform in LA. And we went to New York. And basically, on the plane ride back from New York, I got discovered by an agent. So she she basically had to convince me to come back. And she's like, do you want to try acting? And I was like, no, you know, but she's like, what if you tried an acting class? And I said, all right. So I got an acting class and it, I just fell in love with it. Like the moment I started just because I got to play and pretend and create. And so it was just a, a really it was a really great thing for me. And actually, my first one of my very first jobs was a voiceover job. So it was really it was really cool. So were you encouraged by your family to go after this voice acting job? You know, they were really supportive. I mean, both my parents, they were always very encouraging and they would take me to all my auditions and they took off work to do that many times. They were very, very supportive of whatever I chose to do with that. And, and, you know, I guess, you know, in a certain sense, they did encourage it because they paid for all my singing lessons and my acting lessons. So they must have been somewhat, you know, encouraging. But yes, I was very lucky that they really guided me to do that. So obviously, a little bit of time later in 1992, you auditioned for California Dreams. What made you want to pursue a live acting role versus a voice acting? At this well... Time? You know, it was really interesting because at the time before I did California Dreams, I did Miss Saigon. But even before that, I believe I auditioned for California Dreams first. And then I booked Miss Saigon, which is um, a musical. And I was on tour and I got a phone call from the producer of California Dreams saying, we have a space open and I want to hire you to fill this role. I, I'm basically a role for you. You know, I was so young. I I think I even remember being on the phone thinking, is this for real? Like, what is this, you know? But it all just kind of happened, I don't want to say uh, simultaneously, but it really basically kind of fell into my lap. I mean, I did have nine auditions for California Dreams because half of, of the auditions were um, in person and then half of them were for singing. I've never discriminated against, you know, voice acting or singing or musical theater or TV. I've been fortunate enough to be able to experience all the different genres. So to back up a little bit, how did you find out about the audition for California Dreams? My agent submitted me that at the time for California Dreams. What happened was I was originally auditioning for the part of Tiffany. That That's a funny story because it was actually my girlfriend who played Tiffany, just dropped off her dog just before our interview here. It was her, myself, and then one of my other really close friends, Allie, who went for that same part. And we, we couldn't be more Different. And so, so basically we got down to the last three, which were us, and we went to what's called network. And I didn't get the part originally, but that's why later on the producer called and said, hey, we want to bring you on to the show. So basically, long story short, the call came in to audition for this part and I went. Obviously in 1993 you got the part. Do you feel that singing helped to get you that part? Absolutely. I mean, I probably wouldn't have gotten it if I couldn't sing. And obviously also California Dreams dealt with a bunch of teens dealing from a bunch of different backgrounds. Do you feel that your ethnicity helped you get the role? Originally, no. But again, like I said, it's so funny because I'm born and raised in L.A., you know, and so were my other girlfriends. You know, um, Kelly and I were actually born at the same hospital. And then my other girlfriend was born about 30 miles away from Los Angeles. Originally, we were all very different. And, you know, like the, the part called for California Girl. Well, maybe sometimes people don't you know, necessarily think of me as a California girl, but I definitely am. But then when I call, got called back to come back onto the show, the fact that they wrote a part for me, ne not necessarily the exact Asian background, but Asian, you know, that, that helped. That really helped. 
the second time around. <laughs> and when you joined the show, you were pretty young. Do you feel mm -hmm. that the show reflected what you were going through as a teenager and what people your age were going through? You know, yes, to a certain degree. You know, I think the subject matters that we faced, were, they tried to do universal subject matters, tried to push the envelope when possible. So, I mean, the thing that, that I say that I'm, I'm very proud of is that I would get fan mail or just people would stop me on the street and just said, I just really want to thank you for representing, you know, who I am, you know, like you're a face that could represent who I am in real life. So that was very, very gratifying, you know, to know that I was able to just reflect back what was in society you know and what people wanted to you know like someone who might have looked like them or or faced the struggles that maybe I would have faced ethnically or not or just as a as a teenager you know that was a really great platform and and I I didn't even know that it was at the time to be quite honest I didn't know it would have such an effect on people and then the show ended in 1997 and you appeared in two television episodes, Family Matters and The Nanny. How'd you get those roles? Basically same way I, I auditioned <clears throat> for them. I got a call to go in. Same way, it's, you know, you go in for the initial audition and then you go and if you if they like you, they give you a call back. And so that means that you meet with the producers of the show. And if they like, if you, if they, if you fit what their idea of the character is, and hopefully you do, then they call you to come play the part that, that you've auditioned for. So that's basically how that happened. And then in 2005, you went into voice acting. But before we get into that, you had a musical career, the group Nobody's Angel. How'd you all meet up in that group? So Nobody's Angel was pre-existing before I got into it. And when my same girlfriend who I went to network for California Dreams, who the my other friend who didn't get the part either, she was in Nobody's Angel, and she was like, Jenny, come, and I want you to be in this group. So <laughs> I went, and they were already signed to Hollywood Records, which is owned by Disney. So basically, I came in, and we recorded an album, which was so fun to do. And we did some touring with that. We had a development deal with ABC Family, and... Um, we shot a pilot for basically Nobody's Angel. So there was a lot of life with, with the group. So basically, with the music industry, it's really interesting because we had a really, really great album. And the album, with things like timing and all that kind of stuff, sometimes it just doesn't work out. And um, yeah, we put out a really great album, but it just, the timing must have just not worked out. But basically what I can say is Hilary Duff and Miley Cyrus are very lucky that we were the guinea pigs for Hollywood Records because by the time they got done with us, they learned how to synergize everything and they learned how to do merchandising and TV shows and they got it together. But it took a little bit of experimenting with some other bands and groups like us to know how to do all that kind of stuff. But it was a great time. I wouldn't have changed that. Are you still in contact with members of the band? And are you still on like friendly terms? Oh yeah, definitely. I actually am doing um, a project with my girlfriend who asked me to join Nobody's Angel. So just as of the present time where she has um, a kid's show that she is she has created, which is amazingly fabulous. And you can see me in a music video as Priscilla for Kids Rock and it's, it's a really cool song. It's like kids music and a high energy kids show but the music, one of the producers of Nobody's Angel that produced a couple of our songs produced this song so it's awesome. It's like pop music that sounds like adults would listen to but is geared towards kids so it's amazing. It's amazing music. Now a bunch of my viewers are big fans of the show Avatar The Last Airbender character Suki. How did you get that role? So I actually went I went into my agent's office and auditioned for it and basically they booked me from what they heard on my audition tape originally I was supposed to just be on one episode but I guess because the fans liked the character so much they would bring her back and I did not even realize by the end it was like I was basically on that last season kind of like a reoccurring character which was so wonderful it was a such a great experience so how did you go about auditioning for it I auditioned in my agent's booth and again they sent it in and they and they liked what I did I went into Nickelodeon for a callback and basically they they 
booked me after that. It was a quick process, luckily. And in recording, how did you go about recording? I would go to Nickelodeon in the studio, and most of the time it would be me and Jack Decina, and then a lot of the times the cast would be there, which is not always the case when you're recording voiceover. A lot of the times, you know, you'll spend time on your own, but we're so lucky to be able to be with each other um especially on the last episode all the characters were there which was amazing that was just the energy was so great but when i was on tour again i wasn't there for to be there live in person so i thought oh they're probably going to replace me but they would just find a studio where i was at for example washington dc and i would just go into the studio and they would pipe in the director over the phone and I would do my scenes and my lines and she would just direct me from LA. And it was, it was such a, I was so grateful, just so grateful that they kept on because I was gone for quite some time. And so they would just, if they needed me, they would find a studio, I would go and I would just do what I had to do. So how did you get into the character of Suki? Obviously she evolved from season one all the way to the very last episode. You know, basically what I would do is it really helped to, well, obviously read the script to see what was going on. And because the writing was so great, I really didn't have to do much. I just would see, sometimes I wouldn't even see the character um, right away, but from the first episode, I was able to see her and see what she was about. But again, because the writing was so great, all I had to do was show up and feel into what was going on in her life and what she felt and um, go from there. It really, luckily, was such a very fluid process. It just clicked right from the start because she was just a young, very um, strong-willed young person and really uh, motivated and, and knew herself. That made it so much easier just to know that. You also voice acted in a bunch of other anime Get Seven, Fate Stay Night, When They Cry, Rose and Maiden. How do you typically receive anime dubbing roles? Same way. Um, what, nowadays, what's different about auditioning for voiceover work is a lot of it is now we do it more on our own from our home studios. I will just record at home and send in my recording. If they like it, they'll hire me. Or if I don't get hired for like a specific anime, then they have that, that audition on file and they, they can refer back to it. So I've booked a lot of jobs just from my auditions that are already on file with the various companies. And yeah, that process is, is much different than a regular voiceover process. And a lot of people don't know no, it's like unless you've watched the anime already, you know, you receive the character you're going to do. A lot of the times you get to the studio and you see the translation on the spot and you have to act on the spot. You don't have time with it. It's really good training. It's super challenging. I mean, at first it was just I was like, what is this? But I think it helped me so much with my discipline and learning how to become even a better actor, you know, because I had to take direction directly on the spot, do it very quickly and so you have to be able to deliver and take direction very quickly. So what do you feel is the major difference between your work as a voice or actress on mm -hmm. Avatar and the anime side? What the big difference is? Time. You know, like I said, with anime, you have to be so on top of your game. Like I said, many a time I'll come into the studio not knowing the character, see the character, learn about the character on the spot and go and take direction that. Whereas, you know, with a video game or a cartoon, you might get the script sent to you. Oh, no, 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 not with anime. Again, unless you've watched it on your own and you know of it, much different. It's just much faster. Now, from a few of your dubbing projects, mm -hmm. you were credited under the name Minx Lee. Mm -hmm. oh, what's the story behind that? As voiceover artists, there are certain stipulations that we go through. And so sometimes you go under different aliases. And I just, I like that name. I made it up. <laughs> I love it. I might change you know something to keep people on their toes but that one is kind of stuck now after a bunch of these dubbing anime voice acting roles you went back to live action roles what did you find challenging about shifting between voice over acting and live acting? you know i mean for me it hasn't been tough just because i know the different genres there's different genres to each kind of 
acting. Say I do a film that's very dramatic. It's going to be different than a three camera comedy on TV, which is going to be different from doing anime, which is going to be different from voice acting for a cartoon. I think that for whatever reason, because I've doing, I've been doing acting and singing for a long time and not just one type, I've been able to transition very easily from one to the next because I've had a chance to do almost every sort of genre, almost like film or TV or music or voice acting. So for me, it's just about knowing what kind of genre it is. So if someone is an athlete, it's like they probably know what things that they need for baseball, which is not gonna be the same for tennis. Or if I'm an artist, it's like the difference between painting and being a sculptor. I just need to know my genres within my field. And luckily I've been able to be blessed to have, again, to be able to touch upon each field. For me, it's been so fun to transition from one to the next. So a few years ago, you actually had a reuniting with the cast of California Dream. How did that come about? Shout Factory decided that they wanted to put the series onto a DVD collection and they wanted to have a behind the scenes reunion. And so they arranged that where we came together and they interviewed us. They put it on the actual DVD series collection. So so they arranged all of that. Those of us who were able to participate in Los Angeles came together and they just made it happen. And in continuing with acting in 2011 and 2012, you appeared in two short films. How'd you get involved in short films? That's something that I hadn't really experimented with before. I don't remember exactly why I decided to go for playtime, but I remember going to the audition. The people who were putting it together were just these young, brilliant film filmmakers. When I auditioned for their project, I was like, these people have it together. And playtime is pretty intense. But my friend Roxy, who actually created and wrote the short, she is now up and coming. Like she's on her second feature film that she's filming. But I was basically part of her first creation, which she is so great. She's great. And a great storyteller and a great director. I mean, she's going to be like a big name one day, just how hard she works and how she brings things together. So yeah, and when I was a part of that, she brought that film to different film festivals, which it did fairly well. And then the other film short, it's so funny, my friend who wrote it is from my acting class, and she just had me read for the different parts because people were missing. So I would like read small part, and then she's like, Jenny, could you read for this part because so-and-so is missing? And I was like, sure, why not? Until like I became one of the leads in the movie. So that was really, really cool. Since then, that film has been in a lot of different films festivals as well. And then in 2013, you appeared in Anger Management. How was it working with Charlie Sheen? You know, he was great. He was on top of his game at the time then. Everybody knows from his reputation on what they see and hear in, in the media. But he was really, really professional and a gentleman and really easygoing and, and nice to work with. Everybody on that set was really nice. The food was good, you know, but it was great. It was a great set, had a great time. And my scene was with Charlie Sheen and directly with him and he was great. Really have anything bad to say about him. How do you feel that your roles in being in plays and being on a stage have affected your acting career overall? I am grateful to have a theater background. Having my theater background has trained me and given me discipline to do all of these things. You know, learning how to develop her discipline, learning how to do anything, you know, on the spot, live, under difficult circumstances. I broke my thumb on stage when I was 18 doing Miss I gone. Like I finished the show. I mean, it's given me the best discipline that I could ever have, which allows me to just be more confident in what I do amongst all the genres of singing, acting, voiceover work. And just to kind of, I don't know if I really talk about it that much, but I, I learned how to do motion capture, which is if you have seen the movie Avatar. It's when they do a lot of it on green screen. And I did that for a video game called True Crime. And this one was True Crime Hong Kong. And basically for motion capture, what they do is they have the camera set up on a huge sound stage and you wear like a wetsuit with all these lights on it that are reflectors and you're wearing a helmet that there's a camera attached to this metal bar and then when the camera goes on the light shines on your face so you're basically blinded it is so intense and the characters that I played you know like this one character she was just crying the whole time and having this emotional breakdown the whole time and I thought oh my gosh like with this light shining in my eye and this person attached to me because they're following me with cords and it was super intense and I'll 
I'll tell you that the director said, I mean, and I had to end up covering a bunch of parts because like, for example, if you get into a car, you have to make sure you go at the same height each time. Or if you pick up water to drink, you have to pantomime it and you have to actually hold the actual width of the cup the same way every time. He said that he had to turn down actors because they couldn't do it. And he said, do you have a theater background? He said, and I said, yeah. He's like, that's why you can do it. People who've never had theater backgrounds, they couldn't handle it. And even for voiceover work, my agent um, was telling me, she's like, all my really great voiceover actors, not all of them, but many of them, my voice actors, the ones that are really good have theater backgrounds. And so, I mean, I'm really grateful that I have that because I can really kind of bounce around and just take that discipline, adjust it however I need. And finally, do you have any advice for people who want to get involved in live action roles, voice acting or music? My advice would be if this is something you're passionate about, you have to be just as passionate to do the work behind the scenes, which means oh, you need to beef up on your acting skills, take a class, read a book, practice. If you know you want to be a singer and you're not quite sure, you know, like how to do it, practice, take some lessons. What I do also too is I do private coaching and a lot of the times people will come to me and they're like, I have an audition tomorrow. All right. I'm not a miracle worker. You know, I can help you with what I can help you with. You just never know when that call is going to come that you have to be right there on your best game, ready to act, ready to sing, ready to interpret, ready to whatever it is. And if you don't have the chops to do it, it just makes it more uncomfortable, you know, for you, you know, doing it, you know, so that's the way to build confidence is to just get what you need to do to be prepared for yourself. And you're going to feel so much better at what you do. And if, if you have the passion for it, if you have, you know, the desire for it, you know, do it because you love it. Don't do it because you're chasing fame or you're chasing, you know, what you think might be you know, glitz and glamour because, <laughs> you know, an overnight success. Yeah, there are some that are overnight successes, but an overnight success could be 10 years in the making. You just never know. And do you have anything that you'd like to promo Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, website? Let's see if people would like, they, they can visit my website. It's pretty easy. It's jennyquan.com. J-E-N-N-I-E-K-W-A-N.com. I do have some anime, new animes coming out that I can't talk about yet. I'll give you a little hint. I, I just finished doing episodes for a new cartoon to that be promoted in, in a major toy store. You probably know which one. So they're going to start airing some cartoons in the toy stores across America once it comes out for promo for a shoe line. And uh, you'll be able to see that. And then eventually it'll move on to YouTube. So pretty excited about that. And again, if they want to see me as Priscilla Poodle in uh, Twinkle Time and Friends, they can visit my website to it's kids rock or they could look at it on youtube so i'm trying to think if there's anything else in the moment that is that can be loved and i'm instagram i'm jenny underscore kwan j-e-n-n-i-e underscore k-w-a-n so follow me on instagram thank you for listening to this week's podcast and remember to subscribe to this podcast so it finds you and you don't find it and everybody have a great week